All right, so uh, since we're talking about God pouring love into our hearts, and this is our hope, I want us to consider John and what he wrote in the three angels' messages in connection with what John wrote in 1 John 4, 16 through 18. So I'm going to read the three angels' messages out of the NIV. Let's read this first. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or his hand, he too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured out full strength in the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast in his image or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey the commandments of God and remain faithful to Jesus. Hold that right there in your attention. And now let's consider what we just read, and I want you to harmonize it with the same author inspired by the same Holy Spirit who wrote this in 1 John 4, 16 through 18. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence in the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And I want you to harmonize those two. Fear God and give glory to him. The hour of his judgment has come. And then this long list of horrible things of punishment that come for those who receive the mark. But wait. Whoever lives in God lives in love, and God in him, and love is made complete, and there is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear. Fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Do you fear the judgment? Do you fear the coming punishment? Well, John says, if you do, you're not yet perfect in love. Do you see any tension? The same author, same Holy Spirit. Or do you see the three angels' message saying the exact same thing? Does it sound the same? So, how are we to fear God, but then if we have God's love in our hearts, we have no fear? I don't think that fear means the fear that we think of. It's, it's uh, give glory to God, don't fear God, honor God. Okay, so she's saying the first fear doesn't mean what we typically think. It means awe and respect and admiration. Okay, great. So we can find harmony by recognizing that the fear in the fear God and give glory to him isn't actual be afraid or be terrorized. Wonderful. Because in love, we don't have terror or dread, but we will have admiration and awe, won't we? So we can, beautiful. We've got that part worked out. Wonderful. Now, let's let's keep going. What is then the relationship between fearing God and judgment and the confidence of love that we're to have in the day of judgment. Well, Fear God and glory to him for the hour of his judgment has his come. It's judgment, though. It's not our judgment. So okay. how can we shouldn't have fear because we're not being judged. So, so how's that related to love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. Is being like him connected with giving him glory? Sure. Absolutely. Do you see that? Yeah. And and we will have confidence in the day of judgment. Because we're like him. Because we're like him, we don't need to fear the outcome. So another word for judgment is? Diagnosis. In the day of diagnosis. If we're like him, we don't mind the inspection and the examination. If we've had rebelliousness and wickedness and evil purged and righteousness reproduced within, we're not afraid to be examined on examination day if we're being examined. But we also become powerful witnesses. So given this example before, somebody has a terminal illness and a doctor offers them a cure, takes one pill, boom, illness is cured. 
Do they become a witness for the doctor and his cure? Yes, they do. Do they get any glory to self? I was sick and dying. I didn't do anything. Took the medicine he gave me. No glory to self. This is a, we give glory to him by showing that we're like him in that day, that we have been changed from rebelliousness and fear and self-centeredness to trust and love. We give him glory and people can make judgments about the one who has the cure. What about fear having to do with punishment? The one who fears is not made perfect in love because fear has to do with punishment. So this fear isn't the awe and admiration fear, is it? It's the real fear. And this is, she said, that's the real fear. <laughs> the real deal. Right. Real deal fear. Okay. Fear has to do with punishment. Fear, this is self-centered. It's all about me. I'm going to get hurt. Well, how does love drive that out? Perfect love casts out all fear. How does that work? When you, when you do what God says and it changes who you are, then you love and you don't expect. So where is the orientation of your heart's desire when you love? Where are you oriented? Where's the orientation of your heart's desire when you're afraid? Yourself. Okay. Notice the difference. When you actually love, your concern for self is set aside for something greater than self that you, you value more than you value self. It's not that you don't value yourself. It's not that you want to suffer. It's not that you have a desire to have harm come. But, but something you value so much more than yourself, you're willing to suffer for. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego on the plain of door. Daniel in the lion's den. Uh, I can promise you, if we could interview them, not one of them said they were looking forward to the, the, the heat treatment they were about to get, the heat therapy. No, they weren't looking for the, or the time. Well, I've always loved at lions. I'd like to, you know, maybe be a, a lion tamer. Uh, Daniel's probably not looking forward to that. There's no part of them that wanted it. But they were willing to suffer it because they loved God more than they loved protecting themselves. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So what happens then if punishment is viewed as coming from God rather than coming from sin? Those who sow to the carnal nature from that nature reap destruction, Galatians 6, 8. So the Bible teaches that there's a punishment for sin, but it comes from sin. It destroys us. But if we remove that and instead teach that the punishment comes from God, then where do we place our fear? Yeah, they love. You can't love somebody that you know is going to punish you. She says you can't love somebody you know is going to punish you. Yeah. Okay. What about parents and their children? They're not punishing. They're disciplined. Thank you. She knows. She knows. Yes. They are not punishing. Punishment comes from punitive, meaning to exact vengeance upon. They're disciplining, discipling, teaching. It means they're educating in love. And so, yes, uh, parents or God disciplines those they love. That's discipling. Okay? So this is where, after the thousand years, the whole question of rising the wicked again, only to see them suffer in the flames, it's never discipline. They're not going to learn. They're not going to change. You're not going to be transformed. So what's going on? You have to have an explanation for that. The fires of the three angels' message. There will be full force of God's wrath without mixture with mercy. That's right. God is no longer intervening to protect them, insulate them from reaping the full measure of what unremedied sin does to the heart, mind, character of the sinner. Throughout all human history, God has been interceding and insulating people from the full measure. At that point, he lets them stand in the unveiled glory of his fiery presence of truth and love and full truth burns into their mind. Their lies, their denial, it wasn't me, it was the woman you gave me. All the lies we tell to make ourselves not feel so bad about ourselves are removed. They're aware not only of their own corruption, they have, because I believe this is my view, because it's infinite truth that they're standing in now, the fires of God's presence that are life-giving to the righteous are causing torment. Why? Not from the fire, from the awareness of the sin in their own characters and hearts, and they have awareness. So the man who molested children not only knows what he's done, he will have awareness of the pain that the children suffered under his hand. That will sink in on him. 
Imagine what that will be like to feel their pain that he caused them. And on and on it goes. And that's why, in the end, God doesn't take their lives. They do not want to live in a place where they have tr real truth of who they are fully boring in on them all the time. That would be the that would be eternal torture right there. That would be. And that's why they ultimately surrender their lives, beg for the mountains to fall on them and crush them and hide them from him. as it's, They don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. But it's not an infliction. So we'll, we'll move on. Because, boy, time is going by so fast. There's so much more. We're, Sunday's lesson.